Hey there everyone, AJ back again for the Mighty Glusick channel. I make videos about Dungeons and Dragons lore full time thanks to your generous support, shares and views with multiple uploads every week to help share the rich history of monsters, locations and mythologies of D&D. The Lich, one of the very popular undead boss monsters in Dungeons and Dragons. Today I am going to shove the Lich into the corner, into the shame hole, and instead tell you about the much more dangerous threat, the dreaded Demi Lich. Demi Lich! Sounds less dangerous, doesn't it? I mean, it's only a floating skull. It has a lower challenge rating than a proper lich. It's uh, at CR 18. Still an extremely dangerous foe, but a proper lich is CR 21. And that infamous super lich, Asererak, is CR 23. But wait, wasn't Asererak also a demi lich at one point? Yes, he was. So here is our first bit of lore. A demi lich is a state of undeath that a lich can exist in. But... That state is not always permanent, and in some cases, particularly in the case of a good aligned lich, it is voluntary. Yes, I just said a good aligned lich. We will talk about that today as well. The Demi Lich first appeared in 1978, featured in the very famous adventure Tomb of Horrors, which has had something of a revival in with uh, fifth edition, and we shall be talking about the sudden appearance of Asereric in the Forgotten Realms later in the video. The Demi Lich also showed up in the adventure The Lost Caverns of Sojanth in 1982, and was officially listed in the first edition Monster Manual number no. two the following year. They also show up in 2nd edition Advanced D&D and 3rd edition D&D and none other than the Epic Level Handbook, one of the best D&D resources you can get your hands on for high level play as it inspires a lot of solutions to very high level play even in 5th edition. The Demi Lich then skips over 3.5 and most unusually completely skips 4th edition Monster Manuals for some reason as well and then it's back again nestled in the core Monster Manual for 5th edition of the game. However, there is a lot of lore. Uh, there's a lot more lore than can be added uh, to what you find in the existing uh, most recent listing. And some clarification is needed to help round out what the Demi Lich can do, as well as what it really is capable of being a super intelligent villain. In a nutshell, the Demi Lich is the end result of a Lich who either willingly or through events they cannot prevent, no longer sustains their physical form by feeding it a periodic supply of souls. The necromantic magic that preserves the dead body from the reasonably normal process of decay are severely weakened and the body literally crumbles away to a pile of fragments and dust, leaving only the skull, or on rare occasions just a hand or spine behind. Of course, this is the least important part of the demi -lich. Their physical form remains um, to serve little more than a function uh, of a kind of a necromancy-empowered drone operated by the soul of the undead mastermind. The intellect of the Demi Lich is the same as the Lich. However, their wisdom is higher sitting at 17 as opposed to the Lich, which has a wisdom of 14. And the Lich has a charisma of 16, which is impressive, but it pales in comparison to the Demi Lich, which has a charisma of 20. The Demi Lich is a more experienced older, wiser lich, generally speaking. The list of superior traits of the demi lich just goes on. They are incredibly durable, with an immunity to all necrotic, poisonous, psychic, bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage from non-magical attacks. They even have resistance to magical bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage. They simply can't be charmed, deafened, exhausted, frightened, paralyzed, petrified, knocked prone or stunned. Plus, they have legendary resistance, which means they can simply choose to succeed on a saving throw they've failed three times per day. They are, and it's important to note this, immune to any effects that turn the undead. They have permanent true sight out to 120 feet with a passive perception of 13. Finally, if the Demi Lich is subjected to an effect that allows it to make a saving throw to take only half damage, it always takes absolutely no damage if it succeeds on the saving throw and only takes half damage if it fails. They are small targets, they have no vulnerable spots, they have a natural armor class of 20 and from 32 to 128 hit points with an average being 80. This may not seem like a lot, but they are really hard to significantly damage, and when combined with the sort of supernatural creatures they keep around them as minions, as well as their powers which allow them to regenerate those hit points, it just gets so much, so much harder to concentrate all the party's damage directly on them, uh, when there's so many distractions and other threats which are coming at them from all sides. They are, or there are, you will note, no spells listed with the Demi Lich in the Monster Manual, but this doesn't mean that they are incapable of casting spells. 
they retain their full incredible knowledge of ritual and spell magic, and they have most likely spent lifetimes pouring tirelessly, ceaselessly, obsessively over all manner of arcane and divine scrolls, tomes, and acquired spellbooks. They have a full knowledge of how to brew potions and can direct all sorts of incorporeal, corporeal undead to do their bidding, even constructing magical items and devices that with the other uh, undead following the Demi Lich's precise directions as to how to construct a wondrous rod and things like that. The entourage of the Demi Lich is very important to building an encounter with one that is most likely to execute the entire group of high level adventurers with extreme prejudice. You can expect them to make generous use of creatures that complement their powers and um, and have some utility to them. As the Demi Lich summons, destroys and reforges entities with zero regard for the sanctity of life or the suffering of mortal beings. I should add, this is a neutral evil Demi Lich I'm talking about, the ones devoid of what once passed for humanity, as they have transcended transcended mortal existence and uh, taken on almost a more of a ghostly state of being than a physical one, spending decades at a time projecting across the astral and ethereal plane. They know how to create ghosts and to keep them under tight control. They make a hobby out of creating massive crawling claws that scuttle around in large numbers across their lair. They have all manner of exotic zombies that they use as manipulator arms, vehicles, even just furniture. Having your Demi Lich ride in a compartment inside an undead beholder, for instance, and wade into melee combat with a special pilot pod inside the chest of a zombie giant, itself clad in an armor of crawling claws that can leap from it to swarm over the heroes, Weird new creations such as pits filled with undead entrails that squirm, constrict and throttle anything that falls into their rotting mass. Floor panels held up and kept aloft by level by the masses of tireless zombies or skeletons who on command will drop the floor panels out from under the heroes and then tear them to pieces. Shells full of zombified heads that simply recite memorized texts when asked. Objects that move around on thousands of zombie fingertips. Zombified gelatinous cubes full of wraiths or spectres. Ongoing experiments with vats of demon blood and deconstructed artifacts. Extremely unstable and unpredictable if tampered with or released from secure uh, containment. Such as container waste containers full of gibbering mouthers. Even a good aligned lich will probably accumulate a retinue of undead, such as ghosts who have gravitated towards these beacon lights of negative energy. Ghouls and other parasites who are normally driven off or destroyed by evil liches instead become the somewhat reformed pets and serving staff for the more benevolent lord. No matter how well-intentioned a lich is though, they are deadly to living things who stay around them for too long. The merest touch from a demi lich can permanently paralyze a living being, and their presence is horrific, supernaturally frightening. You have to look past just their physical appearance, and really, pictures can't do justice to just how creepy an actual floating animated super powerful undead skull or spine or hand would be in person let alone zombies, skeletons, ghoul butlers, and so on. A being who is turned into a lich against their will is unlikely as it is that they would continue this existence without some extremely pressing need, and I mean the highest noble cause of self-sacrifice, because it is not in any way, shape, or form a comfortable or beneficial existence to them. A good person who has become a lich must refuse to sustain their body by absorbing the souls of other living beings into their phylactery. The definition of an evil act is to, de- is to deny freedom to another being. When a lich consumes the soul of another being, even if that being is some sort of murderous bad person, they are not just killing them, they are utterly destroying and torturing that immortal soul and preventing it from going on to the afterlife or whatever punishment or reward it awaits it. This is supremely evil. It is a horrific torture. And the lich cannot do this over and over again and remain pure of heart. They simply can't. That's denying basic reality. So, they refuse to consume souls and the body decays away and they have to find some alternate means to remain functional so that they can continue whatever vital cause they are refusing to let go. They need to construct soul gems and doing so takes years, years of research, gathering uh, lots of very rare resources and experimentation to get it right. The gems are fitted into the eye sockets and replace the teeth of the demi skull, or they're set in joints between the vertebrae or replace the knuckles in the hand and form f- faceted jeweled claws on the fingers. Uh, these are the soul gems that allow a demi to remain fully functional. They still have a phylactery, oh, 
And one very important uh, property of the phylactery that we don't see in 5th edition Monster Manual is that it functions as a proxy body for the Lich. This means that a lot uh, Lich or Demi Lich can make full use of magical items normally worn on the body just by putting them adjacent to the phylactery with the same limitations to wearing magic items as anyone else has. So the Demi Lich can be a floating spine and still be technically wearing a circlet of intellect or a ring of invisibility. A floating hand can benefit from having a belt of storm giant strength or a magic weapon that it can summon into its grasp. The other neat trick is that this functions over any distance, as long as it is on the same plane of existence. So if you can find the phylactery, you must really, um, uh, you really must in order to destroy the lich, otherwise it reforms in 1d10 days next to it. And uh, particularly the demi lich, they don't care about their physical form, knowing that they're going to reform in, uh, in a few days. They will fight to destruction. Next uh, to the phylactery will be a fabulous treasure of magical items, if you're lucky, so it's well worth going and finding it. The Demi Lich has the added complication of having soul gems. There are normally eight of these egg-shaped gems of wondrous quality. They require a high level of spellcaster who has supreme skill at crafting wondrous items at about 120,000 gold on materials for each gem crafted. And the things are not even indestructible. They can be destroyed with a decent crack of a warhammer. The Demi Lich must have these soul gems to prevent it from decaying mentally as well as physically. It is these objects that it uses to trap the souls of other beings. Effectively, they're extremely potent psychic amplification lenses, which explains the nature of the powers that the Demi Lich uses instead of casting spells in combat, because the powers of the soul gems are not only immediate, they require no casting time, they're also not limited by spell slots and other complications, such as verbal or somatic opponents. They don't, that doesn't mean the Demi Lich cannot cast spells if it makes sense to do so, and they basically know every whatever spell you, you need them to know as the DM in any particular situation. They have studied magic for hundreds of years. It is what they do. They will summon monsters, they will hurl fireballs, meteor swarms, lightning bolts, and... Uh, create illusions, they'll teleport, drop enemies through planet gateways and slam them close behind them, they'll turn and dominate mines, they'll throw up prismatic walls with tremendous destructive energies. They know spells that could once uh, instantly raise ma ma massive fortifications of iron and stone from the very bedrock, uh, or even shear the tops off mountains and fly them through the sky or devastate whole nations by creating a volcano. Thankfully, such feats are no longer possible, but Demolitions quest for extreme power. They are scouring the multiverse for potential godhood, now that they know it is possible thanks to Vecna leading the way. Many forces stand between them, and this goal of true immortality though, celestial forces that maintain the uh, natural order of things, forces of neutrality that seek to keep the balance between vitality and entropy. The Demi Lich spends a lot of its time as an astral being interacting with the multiverse in a purely mental, spiritual capacity seeking complete transcendence from a rel uh, reliance on any physical form at all and they really have no regard for the physical form so they will fight until destroyed so understandably they don't take kindly to being interrupted in this quest by pesky mortals these inferior transcendent flesh bags deluded and so very overconfident in their abilities the Demi Lich is a brutally merciless opponent. It wastes no time and pulls no punches. If it can kill all the adventurers in the first round of combat, it will not hesitate. It won't stop and gloat about it because gloating is reserved for someone at least that they have a tiny bit of respect or rivalry with. The Demi Lich considers mortals, particularly adventurers, to be nothing more than vermin. The attitude of Asereric in performing is a perfect embodiment of this, to the point where the Archlet Arklich went out of his way to, on two occasions on two different worlds to create a dungeon complex designed solely to kill the living. I've talked a little bit about Acid Rarik's origin in the video on Vecna, so let's go into some more detail uh, since it's been a hot request from people about Acid Rarik. He's a native of the world of Earth, which is known uh, to us as the campaign setting Greyhawk, uh, is the son and ally of the Balor Tarnhen. He is somewhat a devout worshipper of Orcus, which in itself is not the norm for liches, and a one-time apprentice of Vecna. In life, he was the enemy of a powerful paladin of Pelor named Pentaville. He did not actually design his own tomb, that was the work of his ally, the wizard architect named Morgadam. Uh, 
He was revered by a group of wizards known as the Covenanticle of Asarerak, back on Earth. Uh, also, the necromancers of Skull City, the former followers of Asarerak, ended up renaming themselves the Votaries of Vecna, making a new home on the Black Spire on the Plane of Shadow. There is, uh, they're a pretty nasty bunch, but may possibly house some relics and resources of their former master. He's also an unlikely ally and servant of the Githyanki necromancer uh, Castia Zurith Movia, who sought to restore Asarerik to his full power during one of his less active eras, when he was a vestige, in the hope of using the Archlich to defeat the Lich Queen of the Githyanki. As an occasional demi-lich, Asarerik has travelled the multiverse. There's even a, foot stat- a five-foot statue of a humanoid skull on the second layer of Pandemonium, a shrine to his greatness, and no doubt a bolt hole where he has stashed some emergency contingency plan or resource, possibly a spare phylactery. The Tomb of Horrors on Earth has been his home for a very long time. There's also a residence on the demi-plane of Moyle, where he constructs all sorts of devious plans and playthings. He is evil to the core, and quite inhuman. He always was. His life began in torturous violence, the result of an ancient conjurer summoning a demon, a Baylor named Tarnham, far beyond the powers of the summoner to control. Tarnham took his time devouring the conjurer, but not before fetching and violating the conjurer's own mother before his death. Asarerik's mother survived that experience and the unnatural pregnancy that resulted from it. She was corrupted by the whole chain of events, raised her boy despite his origin, but was killed by a torch-wielding mob ten years later. The boy escaped thanks to her efforts and was found by none other than Vecna, the Whispered One, who had a very similar childhood trauma happen to him, so saw the same potential in the young Cambion. Vecna has had some, well, he had some advisors who urged him to dispose of the dangerous Cambion, but instead he executed all the advisors and took on Esarerik as his apprentice. Even then, ten-year-old Esarerik loathed life and all living things, actually looking forward to becoming an undead like his master. He also showed a great, quite a bit of loyalty to Vecna, rescuing the Lich who was severely wounded during the famous Siege of Fleeth. Vecna rewarded his loyalty and promoted Asrerik to be his most powerful mortal companion. After the vampire Cass, the bloody handed, dis- betrayed and destroyed Le- Vecna, or so we thought, Asrerik fled to the vast swamp where he and Morkadam constructed a lair for himself, the Tomb of Horrors as it came to be known. While still alive, Asrerik built an extensive subterranean temple complex in the name of his god Orcus. Burying, uh, uh, its creator Morkandham and all of the workers involved in its construction within the tomb after he executed them all, which is something which he's well known for. Eventually, Asarerik underwent the ritual to transform into a lich and secluded himself away in the labyrinthine tomb, where he committed himself to his studies and eventually demi liched them, abandoning his body for planes and travel beyond the mortal realm. Many adventurers over the years attempted to raid his tomb and some have even claimed to have destroyed Asarerik, but the Lich has spent thousands of years preparing countless methods of surviving and building lairs and networks across the multiverse. Case in point, his subsequent appearance in the world of Toril, where he constructed another lair in the jungles on uh, the jungle island of Cholt. During his very long abs- existence, Asarerik has been all forms of Lich, even becoming a vestige for some time which he uh, could be summoned by characters called Binders, much like a warlock forming a pact in exchange for supernatural powers. Usually summoning, um, the summoner gets lich-like powers, including immunity to cold and the ability to speak with the dead. Asarerik's long-term goal is actually in an emulation of Orcus's rise to godhood. He has constructed some epic means in the Demiplades of Moyle, which uh, borders the negative material plane, and through whatever it is he's constructed there, seeks to fuse his essence with the plane, and through it, gain control of all undead throughout the multiverse. According to the adventurer Prisoner of the Castle Perilous, Asarerik created a simulacrum of himself and in the negative energy plane to torment Sir Pentival, his old foe from his mortal life. The simulacrum eventually transformed into a complete being uh, through the aid of an artifact known as the Soul Machine. I speculate that the goal of Asarerik on the world of Toril was to use the artifact known as the Soulmonger to nourish to godhood the undead atropal he retrieved from the negative energy plane. These are the undead uh, offspring of gods. The 
tomb served as the Atropal's nursery, while the artifact nourished it by trapping the souls of the dead and draining the souls of those that had been beneficiaries of resurrection magic, which would, when you put that together with the fact that his simulacrum became a complete being using a previous incarnation of the soulmonger, perhaps he was attempting to steal the divine spark from the Atropal and raise himself to his status of demigod that way. I wonder if there is actually some another simulacrum of Asrarik located near the Soulmonger that was not mentioned in the Tomb of Annihilation adventure book. That would make for an excellent follow-up adventure, I should think. In 4th edition D&D, Asrarik did, ah, he did appear in the book Open Grave Secrets of the Undead as a member of the Undead Hall of Infamy. He also features in a side quest on the adventure Revenge of the Giants in the 4th edition remake of the Tomb of Horrors as the central antagonist. No doubt we've not heard the last of this evil being and his endless quest to usurp Orcus himself. Right, so, back to our Demi-Lich. Our adventurers have broken into this being's lair, where they are confronted by pits, spikes, blade traps designed to lop off hands, since those hands can be used to make crawling claws if the adventurer, uh, adventurers are your typical murder hobos. I'd say they fit the requirements for turning them into crawling claws. The Demi Lich is totally immune to negative energy, so plenty of that around in the form of wraiths and profane objects, which are just filthy with the stuff. Undead are totally immune to poison, so plenty of that all over the place. In fact, why have breathable air at all? Fill the place up with toxic gas. A lack of uh, any oxygen would certainly keep the zombies nice and fresh. The Demi-Lich can cast light rather than needing to light candles, and most of its exper experiments don't need a Bunsen burner, so why have any oxygen at all? When the Demi-Lich becomes aware that a serious threat has disturbed its activities, it will send waves of minions by order of ease of replacement. So, first it sends the most ex expendable is the humanoid dead, skeletons, zombies, then the intelligent dead, whites and vampires. It will relay orders and keep softening up the interlopers with the continuous hit fade tactics by shadows and incorporeal undead. The ghosts are one of its most potent weapons. Their ability to possess the living is extremely effective and their other powers are a perfect complement to those of the Demi-Lich, including their ethereal sight which gives the Demi-Lich an added precautionary surveillance. Don't forget to make use of the Demi Lich's small size, so dropping down a hundred foot deep narrow hole in the rock is actually extremely effective at escaping most adventurers. So in the final confrontation with the Demi Lich, you have the withering touch, the horrifying visage and the possession of ghosts. Keep in mind though that the possession of the ghost automatically ends if the character pos uh, possessed drops to zero hit points. The Demi Lich is certainly aware of this and every other tactical aspect you can put together in the rules. They're extremely intelligent after all, so they know all of the stuff as well as you do. As for the Demi Lich itself, it can release, um, unleash a psychic howl that recharges a roll uh, on a roll of 5 or 6 on a 6 sided dice. So you can uh, roll that each time it's used. Each creature within 30 feet of the Demi Lich that can hear the howl must make a save on a DC 15 constitution saving throw or drop to 0 hit points. On a successful save, the creature is frightened until the end of its next turn, so massively effective. The Demi Lich also has a ranged life drain power through the soul gems that will glow for around 24 hours after the Lich kills anyone drained uh, by draining their soul out of them. And during this time, the soul is trapped and the being is being consumed utterly inside that gem by the Lich. So the body cannot be raised from the dead by any means unless that soul gem is broken at which point the soul can either travel onto the Arthur life or be raised back to living again by magical means. The Demi Lich targets up to three creatures that it can see within 10 feet of it with this life draining power. Each target must succeed on a DC 19 constitution saving throw or take 6d6 necromantic damage. This necrotic damage. And the Demi Lich regains hit points equal to the total damage dealt to all targets. So up to... What was it? Three targets within 10 feet? 66 damage each? And all of that gets re regenerated by the Demi Lich. This makes the Demi Lich very difficult to destroy. Also, it ha if it happens to uh, have other intelligent undead around it, that it can cast spells such as harm, like a vampire casting harm on the Demi Lich, that would heal the Demi Lich for where, however much damage would normally be inflicted on a living being. And don't forget that uh, that life draining ability isn't a recharge ability, it can do that constantly. 
Also, while not mentioned, if the Demi Lich flies into and physically strikes a living being, it can cause permanent paralysis. If the target is a creature other than an elf or an undead, it must say make a succeed on a DC 16, say, constitution saving throw, or be paralyzed until magically restored. They may have dropped that in 5th edition to keep the uh, difficulty of the Demi Lich a bit lower, but traditionally it can certainly do that, and it makes sense that it wouldn't lose that ability to do that, uh, because liches can. Next thing to consider is the actions that the Demi Lich can take at the end of the turns of its enemies and allies during combat. These are called legendary actions, and it can make up to three of them, though some of the actions can take... Uh, can count as more than one use of this feature. The legendary actions include flying up to uh, half its 30 foot flying speed or create a cloud of dust where the uh, the demolich magically swirls its dusty remains and each creature within 10 feet of the demolich including around a corner must succeed on a DC 15 constitution saving throw or be blinded until the end of the demolich's next turn. The creature succeeding on that throw is immune to this effect until the end of the demolich's next turn. So it can keep doing it to the same targets even if they succeed on the saving throw. It can also use two of its legendary actions to unleash a power called Energy Drain. Each creature within 30 feet of the demolich must make a DC 15, so significantly lower, constitution saving throw. On a failed save, the creature's hit point maximum is magically reduced by 3d6 points. So, uh, if they're at full health, it's reduced down to 3d uh, by 3d6 points. So they can only heal up to that point, the hit point maximum, the new maximum. If a creature's hit point maximum is reduced to zero by this effect, the creature dies. A creature's hit point maximum can be restored with the Greater Restoration spell or similar magic. So it's actually quite difficult to recover from that sort of injury. It can spend all of its legendary actions for that combat round by unleashing a vile curse. The Demi Lich targets one creature it can see within 30 feet of it. The target must succeed on a DC 15 wisdom saving throw or be magically cursed. Until the curse ends, the target has disadvantage on attack rolls and saving throws. The target can repeat the saving throw at the end of each of its turns, ending the curse of success. Personally, I would only use the legendary action if the Demi Lich is just supporting its minions while it is safely ensconced in some zombie vehicle such as an undead beholder or maybe a zombie giant crab. And that's only really effective against uh, opponents which use melee attacks. It's no use against a um, an enemy wizard or something like that who um, doesn't need to worry about making attack rolls advantage or disadvantage. Finally, it has lair actions. These only activate if you roll a d20 at the start of the round and get a result of 11 or higher. So that's unusual for boss monsters in that it's a 50-50 whether it can use a lair action or uh, a lair effect, a lair action or not. You can choose between the tomb trembling violently for a moment with each creature uh, on the floor of the tomb having to succeed on a DC 19 dexterity saving throw or being knocked prone. DC 19 dexterity saving throw is quite extreme, so that's one hell of a lot of shaking. Or the Demi Lich targets one creature it can see within 60 feet of it. The anti-magic field fills the space for of the target, moving with it in, uh, until initiative um, count 20 on the next round, so the, the very start of the next round. So an anti-magic field, as per the spell, is actually really potent, and that's one of the ones that the Lich would be looking to use most often as a uh, lair effect because an anti-magic field is absolutely devastating to a spellcaster. Or the Demi Lich targets any number of creatures it can see within 30 feet of it. No target can regain hit points until initiative count 20 on the next round. So it not only is it reducing the hit point maximum and draining the hit points of other beings, it can actually stop them regenerating any damage at all. As for the other prior, uh, properties of the lair, these traits are officially suggested in the monster manual. For the first time a non-evil creature enters the tomb's area, they take 3d10 necrotic damage, just through the general environment being extremely hostile to life. Monsters in the tomb have advantage on saving throws against being charmed or frightened, and against features that turn undead. And of course, as uh, the Demi Lich cannot be turned, also crawling claws can't be turned, um, and also things like uh, flesh golems and things like that can't be turned. So it would, uh, might possibly have some flesh golems around or shield golems. The tomb is warded against the magical travels of creatures the Demi Lich hasn't authorized. Such creatures can't teleport into or out of the tomb's area or use planar travel to enter or leave it. 
Effects that allow teleportation or planar travel work within the tomb as long as they aren't used to enter or leave the tomb's area. That is probably not applicable to the Demi-Lich itself, um, because it created the effect in the first place, so why would it limit itself when it has that clear advantage over anyone else? Um, the, uh, if the Demi-Lich is destroyed, these effects fade over the course of 10 days. If you're planning on the adventurers facing off against a more powerful Demi-Lich like Asarerix, Awakened Simulacrum or some such, feel free to give them the power to trap the soul. The Demi-Lich targets one creature that it can see within 30 feet of it. The target must make a DC 19 Charisma saving throw. And we had to talk about this in the recent video I had on uh, extremely high attributes. Charisma is your, your presence, your ability, your, sent, your will to, to affect your environment. Uh, and your sense of self, your confidence in your place and your time and your, um, yeah. So it's actually a matter of denying, saying no with your, your sort of personal willpower and charisma. On a failed save, the target's soul is magically trapped inside one of the Demi-Lich's gems. While the soul is trapped, the target's body and all the equipment on it is uh, it ceases to exist. In the um, lore of the Epic Level Handbook, it actually physically decays right in front of your very eyes. So it rots away to basically dust in mere moments. On a successful save, the target takes 7d6 necrotic damage. And if this damage reduces the target to zero hit points, the soul's trapped anyway, as if it failed the saving throw. So it's a really good finishing move. It's getting close enough to death. Yep, let's hit it with this, the uh, soul trap. A soul trapped in a gem for 24 hours is devoured and ceases to exist. No means exists in order to get that back. Even a, a wish cannot restore that person to life. If the Demi Lich drops to zero hit points, it's destroyed and it turns to powder, leaving behind the gems. Crushing a gem releases any soul trapped within, at which point the target's body reforms in an unoccupied space nearest to the gem, and the same state that it was in when it was trapped. Also, one final note on liches in general. Good liches are going to have to face the prospect that they have to choose between whatever cause they're continuing their un unnatural existence for and the souls of other beings they must consume in order not to decay away and turn into a true undead monster, which is what um, basically a vestige or a decayed lich becomes. They lose their mind and just become a thing that hungers for souls. Also, keep in mind that liches were once very powerful mortal spellcasters for the most part. They know about nobility, rulership, politics and geography. They also undercover, uh, uncover a great deal of additional knowledge about the world and the multiverse in the course of their arcane research. So they're very, very knowledgeable just in general. They are intelligent and do have emotions though. So they can be fooled, they can be manipulated, and goaded into making stupid decisions. Just because you have an intelligence of 20 doesn't mean you can't act like a complete numbskull when pushed to an emotional extreme. Uh, like, subscribe, check out my Patreon for more uh, exclusive content and all the full scripts for these and other videos. Buy some merchandise, wear your geek with pride, check out Patron Blades for a mighty smooth shave. A special shout out to uh, a new adventurer in the world, Aiden. Um, thanks for uh, that uh, that news, Gerbil. And always, thanks for listening, and I'll be back with more for you very soon.